pretty much all of the cool embedded designs today have a camera in them. Whether you're making a self-driving car that can read road signs, or a search and rescue drone to find people in the water, or heck, even a smart security camera to catch people doing... <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> that was embarrassing. Anyway, whatever reason you have for bolting a camera to your system, you'll need to do a lot more than just show an image on a screen. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Today's embedded designs need to do some sophisticated analytics on the video images they're capturing. And that means we need a lot of computation on a tiny amount of power. My guest today is Dennis Crespo from Cadence Design Systems, and we're going to look at some new high-performance Tensilica processors designed specifically for these high-performance, low-power embedded vision applications. Before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find out more information about Tensilica Vision DSPs for imaging and computer vision. Hi, Dennis. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Amelia. It's great to be here today. Okay, so it seems like a lot of designs today require cameras for something. What kind of use cases are you seeing for cameras in electronic systems? Yeah, let me talk about where the technology for imaging is going here. First is the mobile phone market, of course. Tablets, handheld devices, cameras, and of course, the ubiquitous smartphone. So inside of the smartphone, you have the camera processing system, and they have processors doing high dynamic range, video stabilization, lots of face detection, and about 30 other applications that make your phone very entertaining and super useful. And our DSP is sort of running the back end of that engine. Moving forward in, in other markets, we're starting to see traction in places like automotive, where there we're doing things like sign recognition and lane departure analysis and object detection and seeing if it's a cat or a dog or a bird or what the heck's going on in front of you, behind you. So that's all happening outside the car, and our DSP is the main processor for that. Very cool. Inside the car, we're also there doing things like gesture detection and looking at your face and deciding if you're falling asleep or you're angry or sad or emotion detection. And the reason for that is the safety goes goes beyond just what's going on outside of your car, but what's happening inside your car as well. Right. So the gesture detection is really being used for radio control or entertainment systems or muting without having to touch anything. The other markets that are starting to come on now are things like drones. What we're doing with drones now is we're adding the awareness of objects around the drone using other cameras and other views that the user can't see. That way the drone can correct itself as you fly it into a fence. It won't do that. Very cool. Traditionally, we've been in the security camera markets as well as wearables. And in the security camera markets are kind of interesting, right? So there are a million of these cameras all over the place. So what's happening now is they're using our DSPs to add this kind of great sensing functionality into the cameras right at the camera. So it'll say, hey, there's a crowd standing in front and there are 50 people there. When there was only five people there five minutes ago, you might want to take a look at this. And it'll pop that feed up into the operator as a notification. So that's happening now as well. And that's going to go all the way to your drop cam on your front doorstep of one you might deploy yourself as an end user. Okay. And finally, for wearables, we're going to add that camera into the smart watch and other wearables. And then the, using the DSP, we can add a bunch of different applications, including that FaceTime application or video chats or other things. That's the next generation watch technology. So vision is really technically challenging because it requires a ton of processing capability on a really small power budget, right? What trends are you seeing in image processing these days? That's a good question. So there are really three major trends, right? First in the imaging system, and this is where you're actually changing the pixels as they come in, right? They're gray and you want to make them blue. Right. They're white and you want to make them gray. So you're actually doing some changing. So in that area, the sensor that's capturing that light are getting larger and larger in terms of resolution. So last year's phone was eight megapixels. This year it's 12. And actually there are phones out there that are up to 32 megapixel. But the size of that sensor is actually the same or smaller. Now the problem with the size being the same or smaller is it adds a bunch of different noise patterns in to that image natively that you need to get rid of ah. in order to make a beautiful image that everybody will say, I want to post on Facebook. Right. How do they do that? Well, that was relatively simple when that sensor was one type of sensor with one type of noise pattern amongst the entire industry. But now 
there are 12 or 15 different types of sensors out there that one manufacturer might want to use in one cell phone line. Right. So they have to run a different type of noise reduction for each one of those sensors, and they run that on the DSP because it's programmable. Used to be in hardwired logic, they kind of said, forget about it, we give up. We're just going to use a DSP for that because we can tune that very fine for every type of sensor they pick, and they can actually add value by making new algorithms. That's one big trend. The other big trend in sensors is this changing of sensor formats. For years, there was this format called Bear. This is what every sensor was for 15 years. Okay. Now, there are new types of sensor formats. RGBC is one of them. That C is a different color. So it can be picked. It can be RGB red. It can be RGB green. It can be RGB blue or violet or yellow or whatever the manufacturer prefers. Okay. The benefit of that is you get a higher dynamic range when you add another color in there. Ah, this okay. trend actually happened first on big screen TVs about four years ago where they added an extra color color in there and give you a higher dynamic range. In order to process that, you need to have a different processor that understands the programmable color part of this. Sure. And so they're doing that on the DSP now and not in hardware. Now, along with all of those new sensors and all those new sensor formats, there are a ton of end user features that happen on everybody's phone that people love and they buy new phones for. You know, when I bought an iPhone 6, it had video stabilization, and I loved it because I no longer had shaky man camera images that I had to worry about. That video stabilization is running on a DSP and is different in terms of its programmability depending on the situation and how much shaking is going on. That plus low light reduction, content adaptive detail enhancement, wide dynamic range, which is something that's not in your phone yet, you're going to want next year, high dynamic range, which is in your phone now, those are all algorithms that run on this processor, and that list is getting longer and longer and longer every day. In fact, some manufacturers are doing software updates midway through your lifespan, giving you more of these types of features. Giving enough processing power for all that to happen in a programmable way is really what a DSP does in the system. The last big imaging trend it will happen next year, and this is where everybody updates their new phone to the multi-camera support. So a couple cameras on the front of your phone, a couple cameras on the back of your phone. There's also better versions of high dynamic range and wide dynamic range to get even better saturation of color or more accurate colors using multiple cameras to do that. So in computer vision, the trends are really being driven by automotive. So this is where you have lots of different object detection, uh, self-driving cars, you know, where you're doing lots of people detection, street side detection, vehicle detection, and 50 other different types of detection to keep from running into things. Right. Machine vision is another area where we're seeing a lot of robotics type applications. So this is like right, robots running around picking packages up and you know putting them in UPS bins for them shipments. That's one thing. But there's also restocking of shells in like your Safeway. It'll happen overnight. But that's going to be done by these machine vision type robots. So DSP is used for all of those types of algorithms. Very cool. And the last one is deep learning. And this is kind of ubiquitous amongst all the markets, mobile and automotive and drone control and everything we talked to up to this point. And this is the ability to sort of train a machine how to identify a cat, the type of cat. Is that cat moving or is it stationary? What the emotional state of that cat may be. That all can be done through this deep learning technique and the DSPs can process all of those images and deliver that sort of object recognition, object detection. Very cool. A couple other really big techniques that are happening that users already have in their homes probably is 3D capture type. What's going on in like the Xbox One or the PS4, which use things like structured light and time of flight sensors. And these are sensors that send out light and measure either the structure of it returning back and create a 3D map or the time it takes for it to return back, therefore creating a 3D map of all the objects in the viewable space. Okay, your name tag says Cadence, so we probably should jump in and start talking about what your solutions are in this space. Tell me a little bit about Tensilica processors and where they came from. All right, Amelia. So we've been around for 16 years, and little do you know, we've been shipping about 2 billion plus cores per year in a variety of different markets from watches to storage to networking, security cameras, printers, IoT devices, and everything in between. Wow. Vision, which I'm talking about today, is the newest of these markets. But we do leverage the 16 years worth of tools, software, infrastructure to sort of accelerate our ability to deploy these DSPs into silicon chips that consumers can use. All right, let's put our nerd hats on and dive into some details, shall we? Where does Vision P5 fit into the whole pipeline between pixels in our image sensor and, hey, there's a cat on a skateboard? 
So looking at this block diagram, we sit next to the sensor typically. First, there's been this processor called the ISP, and this is what takes the sensor data and makes it a pixel that we all know and love, right? That's done by the ISP. Traditionally, that's all been done in hardware, and there's a good reason for that. It's fast, it's low power, and nothing changes. But because of all these sensor changing things going on in the market that I mentioned earlier, the desire to make this more programmable and flexible is what the trend is and what, what our customers are doing. So they're now using the DSP to run some of these traditional applications because they're different algorithms that you need per sensor that you might use. So the lens defect correction is gonna be different for one sensor than would be for another sensor. Now, after it becomes a pixel, and we call this the post-processing pipeline and the image video analysis pipeline, that's where the DSP is sort of the heavy lifting engine. And that's where we run 3D, 2D noise reduction, we like image stabilization, super resolution, which is the ability to zoom your phone to an infinite level so you can read it. And then doing all kinds of different detection from motion analysis, gesture detection, object detection, face detection. That's all run on the DSP. Back me up a little bit and tell me how we got here. This isn't Tensilica's first crack at imaging and vision, right? You guys have been in phones and cameras for years. Yeah, Amelia, so we have been. We started out sort of modestly back in 2006 just doing a simple decode codec for television processing and for cameras that wanted to do MPEG transport. But in 2012, we developed this new architecture, which is this SIMD engine, single instruction, multiple data, a very long instruction word, so V-L-I-W, so I'm nerding out here. But this is the basic engine that is being used today. Back in 2012, it was a 16-bit engine, so it could only take a 16-bit piece of data and do manipulation and put out a result, which was good enough for mobile phones at that point in time. Right. Because back then, you were only doing 640 by 480 type images. But we accelerated into 2013 and into 2015, where we are now, we've had to increase the performance year over year by 4 to 6x for each one of these generations. So on our 2013 generation, we then had to go to HD processing and multiple streams of HD. And we added 8-bit data types and some 32-bit data types. And then now in this fourth generation, which is the Vision P5, we're going all the way up to 4K and multiple streams of 4K as well. So the resolutions go up and up and up every generation. And we're actually ahead of Moore's Law. Nice. You know, 2x every 18 months. We're at 4 to 6x every 12 months. Wow. Okay. So we're ahead of Moore's Law in this particular part of the market because those resolutions and the things that people want to do on their mobile phones have gone into the stratosphere. That's crazy. And we're here to talk about the shiny new Vision P5. Why all the hoopla? What's better about Vision P5 compared with its predecessors? So it's a good question. And the major reason why we're here is this fact that we've increased the performance, not by 4 to 6x, as I was mentioning before, but by 13x over the last generation. And the reason why we had to do that is the processing demands are quadrupling like every six months. Our last generation, we were very fast. In fact, mobile phones will be introduced in 2016 with that. So up to 13x the performance. Now, it's not good enough to increase your performance. We're in a mobile platform. So you have to manage your power too. So through efficiency and the ability to architect our system in such a way, we've been able to reduce the energy by 5x as well at the same time. Wow. The way we've done that is we've basically looked at all the different types of applications and kernels that you might want to run in this vision and imaging domain and have tried to keep everything in the single cycle domain. So we've added instruction types for 8, 16, and 32-bit to cover all the scenarios in which you might be running two or three instructions the last generation to get it down to one instruction, and that drops the power. Along with the additional vector extensions for 816 32-bit, we've added vector floating point unit in there as well, which is new this year. This is a 16-way, so 16 pixels or 16 pieces of data at the same time, and it enabled us to easily port code from other platforms like GPUs or Core i7 Intel processors directly onto the DSP without having to make it a fixed point code conversion. The other real big key to this ability to keep the power low and the performance high is how you deal with memory parallelism. So getting data in, pixels in and pixels out processed without stalling anything is really the key. 
So we have a unique way of doing that and where we can take lots of unaligned memory locations. In this case, it could be a distorted image from a lens, which is all unaligned in memory there, that image. And we can align them all up in our vector register all in one cycle and process that whole thing. In the previous generation, we needed to do a bunch of DSP instructions to line all those bits of data up before we even started the DSP processing for the algorithm to correct that lens distortion. Okay. So this generation, we can do all of that in one cycle. Now, along with that, it doesn't make any sense to have this great machine if only two people in this building can program them. Right. We have a complete set of tools, things like auto-vectorizing C compilers. So you can take your non-vectorized C code and vectorize it for this wide parallel machine without having to do any replumbing of your code. Along with that, we have a complete set of OpenCV and OpenVX libraries, and this is 800 plus functions that are sort of hand-tuned. Part of the libraries are to allow for third parties to use these libraries to build up their applications, and we have investments with third parties for mobile, ADAS, and security and wearable applications that are already in the markets today that are highly utilized by our customers. Okay, let's dive into some details now. I see we have a block diagram. Yeah, I don't want to go through this whole block diagram because it's really busy. It's got a lot of things going on here, but I'll take you through some of the key changes from last year's DSP to this year's. Okay. First is that vector floating point unit on the bottom left there. And that unit allows us to do that 16 vector floating point processes at one time. Along with that, we've re-architected the power management. So now we're doing clock gating at every cycle. So it allows for one block in this machine is not being used. On one cycle, it's being used. and the next cycle, it's off. It's turned off. And so you save the power in between cycles too. Also on the top there of the block diagram, we have a 4 5 12 wide memory interface to data memory. This gives us effectively a thousand bits per data memory on a single clock cycle, which is the widest in the industry. Our closest competitors half that width at 5 12 bits. So this allows us to do multiple applications, multiple memory accesses at the same time, giving us high bandwidth to, for processing those 4K UHD images that you need to move in and out of this memory in a fast way. In the middle there is the processing subsystem, and this is where you have your vector 64-way SIMD pipeline, as well as your vector registers and your load store units to load that memory interface and to store off in the vector registers there. On the bottom side, you have your interface to the outside world, and those are the two AXI4 interfaces there. One of them can be connected to a host memory subsystem, like an ARM or a mobile CPU. The other one can be connected to that ISP I'd mentioned earlier on the previous slide, so we can connect into other parts of the imaging subsystem directly into our host memory interface, and at the same time connect to the rest of the compute subsystem in a mobile phone. All right, Dennis, that's an impressive diagram, but what does it mean in terms of performance? What will this baby do if we take it out on the track? All right, so here's where we get to these kind of specs you want to put on the side of your car here in glowing white letters. First of all, we'll talk about frequency. Everybody wants to talk about frequency when you talk about a processor. We're at 1.1 gigahertz now. Previous generation was at 600 megahertz. The second big piece of this pie here is the ability to process these 256 ALU math operations in a single cycle. Previous generation was 96, so we've done a big jump in the ability of parallelism and efficiency for processing there. As we go into the specific type of operations, we've added 430 new operations. This is through that software profile I mentioned earlier. In order to get all these operations down to a single cycle or the small amount of cycles as possible to keep that power down. And the last, of course, we talked about it before, that super gather technology with that 1024-bit memory interface. We have two of those. Keep those images moving in the pipeline. Okay, so do you have any specific examples about what this means in a real-world application? Yeah, so we have this diagram here, this chart that our customers gave us, or one particular customer, and they say, you can't use my name, but please use the data from this chart. The reason for that is they're still engineering their product right now. But they went through an analysis to figure out if they were going to use the Vision P5 DSP, and this is what they did. So they took a noise reduction application for a 1080p frame, and this is a pretty standard video frame that every phone takes now. Right. And they said, well, how much power does it take per frame to process with a four core mobile CPU subsystem? And this is a standard four core that you would get in any one of your phones today. There you can see that was about 1600 millijoules per frame. And then they said, okay, well, let's port that to a four core CPU plus a four core three pipe GPU subsystem. So they added eight cores in there and actually that reduced it to 700 millijoules per frame. 
but they took a single vision P5, imported that code over, and they dropped it to 60 millijoules per frame. Nice. So that's about 25x more efficient than the standard CPU subsystem. And you can see why they would pick this processor as the third key processing element inside of these SOC subsystems for mobile and ADAS is because you get such a great power scaling compared to using a standard CPU. Okay, wow, that is impressive. Do you have any other examples? I'm always a little bit suspicious if there's just that one guy. Nerds want to know the whole picture. Okay, so for the nerds out there, we'll give you a distribution of performance over our previous generation. Here you can see on the left-hand side, Huffline Transform. It's one of my favorite algorithms. And this allows us to transform you know, curved lines and pick points on a different line in order to do some secondary calculation. There you're seeing 13x more performance than our previous generation. Canny edge detection is the next thing there. That's to detect edges in order to sort of draw the edges out and you can pick the object within the edges. So there you're seeing 11x more performance. And as you go down, all the way to face detection and orb and noise reduction on the other side, you see we're still getting good scaling of about 3x more performance. So it's a distribution of performance over a wide variety of applications, still seeing a high amount of acceleration over a previous generation. And we're really happy with this because this allows us to do a lot more inside of these mobile phone devices. Okay, so earlier you mentioned a floating point unit. Can we talk about that a little bit? So yeah, Cadence is very unique here. We were the only vendor that have a floating point unit you can add into the core that is compatible with what's going on in the GPU and the CPU domain. So a lot of code gets generated in the scientific domain for prototyping these algorithms. And it's done in IEEE 754 floating point code. The trick is porting all that code to fixed point into an embedded domain, you get a big power scaling benefit. However, it takes a long time to do that. Right. So we're sensitive to that. We allowed this optional core to be added in order to bridge that gap between wanting to port some of the code and not wanting to port all of the code over to the fixed point domain. Right. The other real big leverage for this core is, well, it's 32 gigaflops at a gigahertz, so it's a huge amount of performance as well. I'm not counting every one of the operations here. I'm only counting the ones that are 754 compliant. If you count all the other operations, it's close to 45 gigaflops. Okay. It's a lot of processing power in a small core that isn't burning more than 3 or 4% more power than the standard non-floating point registers to do that same operation. Okay. So really key for ADAS, drone control, augmented reality. Anytime you're doing that 3D kind of mapping technology, yeah. you need floating point for that. And also, when we talked about memory performance before, you mentioned something called Super Gatherer? Yeah, Super Gatherer, I named that. You guys can blame me for that. It's a technology that allows us to gather non-contiguous addresses in parallel. So if you look at that diagram on the lower left, those three memory locations are not next to each other or adjacent. Something has to put them next to each other inside of the vector register before you can get the DSP to start processing it. Because the DSP doesn't know where those are in memory space out in storage there. Okay. Previously, like I mentioned before, we had to run a bunch of DSP code to do all that alignment. Now all of that gets done in hardware in one cycle. So that alignment gets done in one cycle, kind of fills up the SIMD register, and then the DSP just processes that in the next cycle. So it's super fast. And it really improves non-uniform algorithms like image warping, which is on every mobile phone. First thing you want to do is de-warp that image that is kind of curved when it gets captured into a, something that looks like a square or a rectangle. Things like edge tracing and non-rectangular patch access also benefit greatly. So that Huffline transform I mentioned before, that's a edge tracing. So that's going to be 13x faster. And the majority of that speed up is through the super gather here. The other thing we do here that's, I know, another nerd thing, we take advantage of all uh, automatic overlap, cutting the queue time. So you don't have to manage if you have overlapped addresses. That all gets managed by the hardware. N- none of the management has done by the software, making it very, very fast. Okay. It also works within that auto vectorizing compiler automatically. So it's automatically going to use the scatter gather engine without having to say, oh, I want to go use that. I have to program it separately. Don't have to do that with this technology. Now, what if I need to do a whole bunch of processing? Can I combine multiple units and scale this architecture? One of the biggest surprises working on the Vision P5 in the last year here is when we started to introduce it to customers about six months ago, we didn't expect customers to use it the way that they are. Huh. A lot of them are using it in mobile, of course. A lot of them are using it in ADAS systems for automotive. 
But then we have a set of customers that said, hey, that looks like it's fast enough, low enough power to use in things like servers for mass big data computing. Oh, okay. And this is for doing face detection over millions of images to sort of pair them up with the actual contact. So you can say, oh, that face is for this name. One of our customers said, oh, you know, I've got this big GPU subsystem that I use 250 watts per GPU to do this deep learning algorithm for face detection in a big server. I think I can use that same processing power with only four cores of your Vision P5, which would give the same processing power as that 250 watt GPU, but now I'm only using three and a half watts. That is huge in terms of a discontinuity for the server manufacturers that are supplying these giant data centers because now it's less air conditioning, it's less power. And they can also say, well, I'm not gonna just use four, I'm gonna use eight because I wanna quadruple the performance and have an even better performance than that GPU and still only burn six watts of power. We don't know where this is gonna go, but we think this is gonna be very disruptive for that market. Okay, shifting gears a little bit. One thing we haven't mentioned much yet is how to program this thing, and that's really important. There have been many of these processors over the last 30 years. I've been involved with a lot of them. It always boils down to the five to six people on the planet that can actually program it to make it efficient to get all this performance out of it and manage the power to be low and the rest of that. Right. Everybody else sort of runs into this, oh, it's really hard to program and my efficiency is really low and just want to throw more gigahertz at it. And so what Cadence has done on its own is put a huge amount of money and time and effort and resources into building the ecosystem up. Very cool. So in the library domain with OpenVX and OpenCV, in the imaging kernel domain, and this is built up kernels that people can use directly that are highly optimized okay. for a large amount of different operations. And in the full application domain, where these are things like face detection, people detection, that we supply sample codes for that our customers and universities and end users can take and build up full applications without having to engineer that themselves. Okay, so it's one thing to have all the Cadence Tensilica solutions, but you mentioned an ecosystem. What other companies are participating in this ecosystem? So Amelia, we have a pretty concerted effort and I was part of this for the last 12 months to sign up these sort of large software entities that live on the outside that supply these big companies solutions for things like wide dynamic range in your cell phone or video stabilization, which now run directly on the DSP because they've been able to use our tool chain to port that on there. So these are companies like Morpho and Multicoreware, Itsys and Almalance, all supplying in mobile phone and automotive markets, different solutions for processing either in the imaging domain or in the vision domain. A company called Multicoreware there, they supply contextual neural networking or that deep neural networking algorithm I was talking about earlier. And that goes into mobile phones, it goes into cars and automotive for object detection, it also goes in that server. Having this ecosystem of great partners already familiar with the DSP and having code up and running and optimized is the key to quickly deploy these systems. All right, Dennis, that was a lot of information. Can you go over the high points just one more time for me? Yeah, so for the Vision P5, we're up to 13x faster than our previous generation. Combine that with 5x lower energy through this advanced efficiency, driven by the fact that we have deeper vector execution data types, you know, 81632 and that vector floating point unit, as well as the super gather to keep everything in that single cycle domain. Combine that with these tools and the auto vectorizing compiler, and we have this sort of complete package available today for manufacturers to build their next generation multi-camera, mobile phone, and ADAS subsystem for automotive. Great. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Dennis. This was super cool. Thank you, Amelia. Before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find out more information about Tensilica Vision DSPs for imaging and computer vision. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, check out EE Journal's YouTube channel or the on-demand section of eejournal.com.